you up. Please stand with me as we uh, read our, our passage of scripture this morning. And, and again, this is not really uh, an expository message. This is, is dealing specifically with this, this attribute of God. I'll be, I'll be dealing with this specific passage a little later in the sermon. But uh, we're looking uh, for now at, at Hebrews um, chapter 6, uh, verses 13 to 20, and then down in uh, chapter 7, from verses 15 to 22. So uh, Hebrews 6, 13. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have fled for refuge, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place beyond the curtain where Jesus has gone, as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And in Hebrews 7, verses 15 to 22, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For as witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former commandment is laid aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. It was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. So we're now in our final week of the study of the attributes of God as laid out in the Baptist Catechism. Remember, the purpose of the catechism was to educate lay people in matters of, of doctrine and in matters of belief. The catechism was a series of questions uh, laid out uh, with questions and answers in order to make uh, the, the study and, and memorization easier. And even for, for children, many parents would, would catechize their, their children to train them in the discipline and the admonition of the Lord. Along with a Bible and the confession of faith, they were, they were often given, new Christians were often given this catechism to study. We've been looking at, at the confession's answer to the question, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Even as we've looked at each of these individually, I, I hope that you've seen how they're, they're all interconnected, how they, they all really fit together. And, and this morning is really no exception. Again, we're, we're going to be studying the truthfulness of God, the, the truthfulness of God. And this word has a, a different connotation in our culture than it did back in the 17th century. Robert Raymond explains that by affirming that God is infinitely, eternally, and unchangeably true, the Catechism declares, declares that he has always been, is, and always be unchangeably so. So saying that, that God is truthful essentially is saying that God is faithful. Now the ground that I'm, I'm hoping to, to cover this morning is that God is logically rational, ethically reliable, and covenantally faithful. Essentially, that what I'm really saying is that, that God is faithful in who He is, God is faithful in what He says, and God is faithful in what He does. What does the word faithful bring to mind? I think that, that for most of us, the first thing we think of when we hear the word faithful is, 
is, is the context of marriage, right? In, in the covenant of marriage, a, a man and a woman make solemn vows before God. Alistair Begg in his book, Lasting Love, quotes the traditional wedding vow, and including the phrase, Will you love, honor, and keep the other person, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto him or her? A husband and wife are, are joined together in a one flesh relationship. But, but they're not joined together by man, they're joined together by God. I've, I've had the, the great privilege of officiating at many weddings, and, and, and when I do, I'm just, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an efficient, I'm not, I'm not the one who joins this man and woman, it is God himself who joins this man and woman and in the covenant of marriage. And when this man and woman come together with these vows, they're not just making vows to each other. Yes, they're doing that, but ultimately, they're making vows to God Himself. Making vows to God. They're, they're covenanting to be faithful to each other, and they're covenanting to be faithful to God. A few things hurt more in, in pastoral ministry than when I find out that that, that a husband or a wife have, have been unfaithful um, to their marriage vows. I've, I've seen the tortured look on a wife's face when she has found out that her husband has been unfaithful. When a husband or a wife engages in relations with someone else, they're, they're obviously breaking their marriage vows. We tend to think of be, them as being unfaithful to their spouse. And they are. But that in any fracture of the marriage covenant involves breaking a vow that was made again, not just to another person, but to God himself. Now this is so abhorrent to us because we have within us a, a, a natural revulsion against all forms of unfaithfulness. It's, it's ingrained in us. We hate it when, when other people lie to us or, or betray our, our confidence. And like I talked about with the kids, that, that we're, we're going to tend to be, be reluctant to trust someone who has proven themselves to be unfaithful. And see, that's where the problem lies. Because in reality, we're all unfaithful. To a certain extent, all of us are, are unfaithful in, in what we, we are commanded to do in, in Scripture, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, and, and just to, to one degree or another, we're all unfaithful to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's why this particular attribute of God is so important. They're all important for us to understand, but, but specifically here, when we consider the, the truthfulness or the faithfulness of God, it provides a firm foundation in the sea of uncertainty. It gives us, the faithfulness of God gives us something to hold on to, even though we, we can't trust, really, really, we can't trust those around us, as we would hope we could. We can't trust ourselves, but we can always trust God. Several years ago, when I was in Australia, I was body surfing and got stuck in a rip, and well, I don't know if you know what a rip is, but essentially it's, it's a, a strong current that can quickly drag you out to sea. And the, 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 so I was, I was stuck, there was, the, the waves were really quite large, and, and I was getting pulled out away from shore very quickly past where I could touch the bottom. And I knew that, that if, if I swam parallel to the shore, that I eventually would come out of the rip and I'd be able to swim back to shore, but this was taking a long time, and I was getting very tired. And, and I was getting scared. And I remember this like it was yesterday. And, and I, I was swimming and I was swimming and, and I was getting so tired. And, and I was literally just about to, to, to raise my hands to, to yell for help. When I put my feet down and I touched the bottom. I, I've never been so happy to feel terra firma under my feet. Well, it's, it was sand, but, but still it was, it was, it was the ground. Just a huge amount of relief, and I, I just, I, I, you'd think I would have gone out of the water, but I actually just went back to swimming again. But, but, it, but it, I was just so relieved. I was so relieved. Do you ever feel like that? Do, do you ever feel like, like you're stuck in a, in a rip curve, and you're being dragged out to sea, and you're getting tired, and you're getting scared? You feel like you have nothing 
to, to hold on to. Nothing to, 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 to feel the, the, the firmness of the ground under your feet. Well, in the faithfulness of God, you always have a firm foundation. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's the anchor that, that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the, biller, while the billows roll because we are anchored to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. So let's consider what, what it means that God is, is faithful in who He is, God is faithful in what He says, and God is faithful in what He does. So first of all, God is faithful in who He is. Scripture repeatedly refers to God as the true God. As Burkhoff explains, when Scripture declares that, that God is the true God, it intends to affirm that God is, metaphysically speaking, the only God who is really there. So God is, is truth, first of all, in the metaphysical sense. That, that is, in, in God, in, in the Godhead it, all of, of the perfections of God are, and the, the faithfulness of God are perfectly realized. He is all that God should be, and as, as such, He is distinguished from all so-called gods, which are vanity and lies. So God is true in His character. He's true in who He is intrinsically, and eternally, and infinitely so. Again, God, God is described this way throughout the Scripture. This, this designation is applied to the Father. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 3. And it's applied to the Son. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. 1 John 5, 20. It's also applied to the Holy Spirit. For when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. John 15, 23. Consider with me for a moment that the powerful image of, of Jesus as the faithful, conquering King in Revelation 19, 11 to 16. If you'd please turn with me in your Bible to Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, on his head are many diadems, and he has his name written on it that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury, the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Doesn't that give you goosebumps? To think of who Jesus Christ is as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords, and as the faithful, as the eternally faithful God. His character is diametrically opposed to every so-called God, every false God. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Psalm 96, 5 and 6. It is utter, utter foolishness to, to try to depend on something that, that can never help you. To, to try to lean on something that is unfaithful. Psalm 115, that 4 to 8, it was read for us earlier. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they, they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Now, if you talk to the average Joe or Joanne on the street, they're, they're going to tell you, I don't worship idols. 
And, and by that, they're thinking, well, I don't have a, a, a little statue in the corner of my room that, that, I, that I bow down to and put offerings in front of and burn incense. Well, some people in our, in our culture do, but, but, but most people you talk to are going to, to say that I'm not an idolater. I'm not an idolater. I don't, I don't engage in idolatry. But every false religion is idolatry. Every false religion is idolatry. The only true religion is, is Christianity. And, and every other is, is the only religion that is, 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 that is grounded on the faithful God. Think of, of Allah, who's, who's capricious. He can, he, he can change his mind on a, on a whim. And, and even, you know, that even Muhammad, according to their tradition, and even Muhammad couldn't know that he was actually saved. We know he wasn't. But according to Islam, even Muhammad couldn't have assurance of salvation because the God of Islam is not faithful. In fact, in every other religion besides Christianity, what is, the, is required for salvation is the faithfulness of people, not the faithfulness of their God. Every, where every religion in the world, apart from Christianity, is a religion of works. It's a religion of works, not grounded on the faithful God. People have false ideas about, about Jesus. Paul talks in, in um, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 that, that, that if people come preaching another Jesus or another gospel, he says, you, you're going to bear with them. But people who have, have a, the, the, their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. This is not Jesus. This is not God the Son if it is not the God of Scripture. That any, any false view of Jesus is idolatry. There's also the, the idolatry of possessions. Uh, again, it's not necessarily bowing and worshipping a statue, but, but, but people's things can be functional gods. Things that they look to for comfort. Whether it's, it's their possessions in their, their home or their car or, or their television set, the computer or, or whatever. They, they, these things can be functional gods, places where they find comfort and confidence rather than in the faithful God of the Bible. People can, can have, make functional gods in their, their pleasure. Um, they can make functional gods in their family. They can make functional gods of their church. It's only the God of the Bible and true faithful worship of Him that, that we can count on. Everything else is idolatry. Everything else is is false worship. Everything else is unfaithfulness to God. None of these things can satisfy. None of these things can satisfy. None of these things can help you when the storms of life come. So you can cling to the faithful God. You can rely on Him. And in Him, you can have confidence. In Him, you can find comfort. Even if the very earth shakes under your feet. Even if a hurricane blows down your house, even if, if you are diagnosed with an in, incurable illness, when your faith is in the faithful God, you can have a confidence that transcends your present circumstances because you are looking not to those, you're looking to God who is eternally faithful. So God is faithful in who He is. But, but God is also faithful in what He says. God's Word, the, the Bible, is our frame of reference for any understanding of who God is. Like a hiker lost in the wilderness, in, in the middle of a blizzard, the, the snow is coming, folks. When, when a hiker is lost in the wilderness, he, he needs a compass to find his way out of the bush. But a compass is, it, that illustration falls short because a compass only points to, to magnetic north, not to true north. The Bible points you to the true God. It, 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 in, in God's word, God describes himself and describes his character throughout redemption history so that we can know that he is faithful in what he says. There's two aspects of this when we think of God's word. God's word is, is inerrant. It's an 
errant, and, and there's a major assault, even within the, the, the visible church, against the inerrancy of God's Word. Men, and, and some of them are, are really well-respected scholars, are denying the inerrancy of God's Word, and they would, they're, well, they're, what they're, they would generally say it's in more minor points. You see what they do when they, when they, when they set themselves uh, above God's Word. And they say that there's any errors in God's Word. What, the, what they're really doing is undermining the whole foundation of the Word of God. And so there might not be any major point of doctrine that is, is at stake there, but, but the, the greater doctrine of God's Word has been completely destroyed. God's Word is inerrant. There are no mistakes in the original manuscripts of the Bible. None. In the original Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek manuscripts, and, and none of those manuscripts exist, but, but each of those manuscripts is inerrant. We can have a, a really an incredibly high degree of confidence because of the, the great number of manuscripts that exist, very, very early manuscripts that, that correspond and, and agree and, and that, that are reliable. But in the original manuscripts of the Bible, God's Word is inerrant. Because God is rational, there are no inherent contradictions in, in Himself. And there are no, in, there are no um, inherent contradictions in His own understanding or in what He declares. The Bible never, ever, ever contradicts itself. Never contradicts itself. Any, any contradictions are apparent contradictions. They're only apparent contradictions. And so when we, we look at things and, and they appear to be contradictory to us, either we don't yet understand them, and some of these, these, these truths we won't ever really fully understand until glory. Either we, either we don't yet understand, or in some cases, because we don't want to understand. Because whatever is, is being, being declared to us in God's Word doesn't fit our way of thinking, and we, so we try to explain it away. You see, the problem that most people have with the Bible is, is not apparent contradictions. The problem that, that most people have with the Bible is that the Bible contradicts them. <laughs> their behavior and their false beliefs, and they don't like it. Atheists, or really who are, they're anti-theists, try to find errors in the Bible. But the analogy of faith, one of the one of the foundational principles of Bible interpretation is to compare Scripture with Scripture. And, and when you understand it in its, in its context, you'll find that it never contradicts itself. That the only rule for understanding Scripture is Scripture. Again from Louis Burkhoff. God is tr the truth in a logical sense, and in virtue of this, He knows things as they really are. Thus, the truth of God is the foundation of all knowledge. Do you get that? The truth of, of God is the foundation of all knowledge. Robert Raymond says, As the God of truth, He is logical for Him. The laws of logic, which are the laws of truth, are intrinsically valid because they are intrinsic to His nature. And John Frame sums it up by saying, Logic is is an attribute of God. So God's, God is faithful in what He says. We see that in, in the inerrancy of God's Word. And God's Word is also authoritative. God's Word is ethically reliable because God is ethically reliable. God says what He does, and God does what He says. These, these things are, are closely linked together. The Bible is really God's story about what He has done in the world, about what He is doing, and what He will do. It's history. It's His story. And one of the ways you can, you can track through the Bible and see what God is, is doing, has done, and will do in history is through the covenants of the Bible. And really the Bible is a story of God's covenants with His people. A covenant is a formal oath, and, and you can track through through the, the Bible, you can track the covenants that, that God made with, with, with Adam in Genesis 3, and with Noah in Genesis 9, and with Abraham in Genesis 12 and 17, with Moses in Exodus 20, with David in 1 Chronicles 17, and with Jesus in Matthew 26 and 27. Sorry, 20, Matthew 26, 27, and 28. And we say this every time we receive the Lord's Supper. He took a cup, 
And when he had finished, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that, that covenant in the blood of Christ, you can, you, can tr you can track the covenants all through the Bible. They point to the covenant, that new covenant, in Christ. And one of the covenants that, that is, is the most flashed out for us in Scripture, no pun intended, is the covenant that God made with Abraham, where, where God put a, a deep sleep upon Abraham. God was asleep, Abraham was asleep, and, and there was... Well, Abraham had made the sacrifices and, and put the the, the, the the remains of the animals in a line. And while Abraham was sound asleep, there was a, a flaming torch and a flaming fire pot that, that went through the middle of those slain animals. What that's saying, when, when this, this is, is speaking in the, in the language of the ancient Near East, a covenant, what, the, the words you, you would say is it's, you would cut a covenant. What it's saying is the, the animals would be slain and there would be blood of that sacrifice. And what was being said is, is that if, if one of us, if one of us breaks that covenant, may what, may what happened to those animals happen to me. You see the significance of this? Abraham was asleep when God passed through the middle of the remains of those animals. God was saying, I am going to uphold both ends of that covenant. And so when we talk about the, 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 the covenant in the blood of Christ, what happened to those animals did happen to Christ. As he was slain for our sin. Because God is the faithful God. He is the covenant keeping God. And he is so faithful that he poured out his wrath on his own son in our place. And so we can trust that God is faithful. God is faithful in what he says. He is faithful to keep his covenants. Very quickly, I'd like to have a look at, at Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20, the passage that I, I read earlier. You turn with me there in your Bible, please. Hebrews 6, 13. When God had promised Abraham that he would give him a child, he swore by himself. God swore by himself, verses 13 and 14. And, and people swear by, by something greater than themselves. I was talking to, to a guy yesterday um, in, the, in the community, and he was saying, um, he was saying that there was, wasn't something that he had done, and, and he, said, he said, I swear by whatever it is you guys do over there. <laughs> he didn't really know what, what, you know, what really who we were worshiping, but he said he knew that there was something greater than himself, and so he swore by whatever it is we do over here. God swears by himself. And God wanted to convince Abraham and his descendants that, that how his promises would never change, and so God made an oath by two unchangeable things. God's character and his oath. God's character and his oath. Two things that will never change. God's character will never change, and God's oath will never change. And, and that's part of the reason why I, I believe that, that there is a future for Israel. Because God is faithful to his promises to Abraham and his descendants. You can read about that in Romans chapter 11 as well. So we have, a, we have a confidence, a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us because God is faithful to his character and faithful to his, his oaths in verses 16 or 17 and 18. This is the anchor of our soul. This is the anchor of our soul. This is the hope that, that we have that, that, that has entered behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies. This is the hope of Jesus Christ who has gone before us on our behalf. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, verses 19 and 20. And I won't get into detail about who Melchizedek was, but he was really unique in Scripture as a priest, as a king. You could read more about him in this passage, but also in Genesis 14. And Abraham gave offerings to him. Now skip down to Hebrews uh, 7, verses 15 to 22. We'll read that Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, verse 17. He was made so by the Lord's oath. The Lord has sworn an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. 
You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Verses 21 and 22. So this passage shows us that God is faithful to Abraham because he made an oath on himself. We also see that God is faithful to us because he has made an oath on Christ. He has made an oath on himself and he can never change in his character or in his promises. God cannot lie. Numbers 23, uh, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? God cannot and will not ever lie. But then contrasted with, with human beings, contrasted with us, in, in Romans uh, 3, verses 3 and 4, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let, let God be true, though everyone were a liar. As it is written, you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Do you realize that your faithlessness cannot even overcome the faithfulness of God? That is how faithful our God is. Excuse me, there's still an application for us as we walk through this life. Because God is faithful, because God does not lie, we also must not lie. We must not even bend the truth. We talked about this in Hebrews 4.25, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor. May there never be lying amongst the people of God. We are to reflect His character. And part of being faithful also means let your yes be yes and your no, no. Let your word be your bond. When you say you're going to do something, do it. When you say you're, you're not going to do something, don't do it. When you say you're going to be there, be there. When, when, they say, when you say you're going to be there at such and such a time, be there at such and such a time. Now I, I know, and many of you will know, that I'm continuing to work on this one. God is continuing to work on me in this. But because God is faithful, we can know that, that He is going to, to do that in us. He's faithful in what He says, and He promises that, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. So that particular sin, whatever it is, how you're being unfaithful to God and unfaithful to, to other people, if you are in Christ, God has promised that He will sanctify you. God has promised that He will make you like His Son. And so you can trust that, that because of the faithfulness of God, not because of your faithfulness, but because of who God is, that, that He is going to sanctify, that He's going to change you, that the circumstances of your life are slowly but inexorably going to make you more like Jesus. And every day, even though you don't necessarily see it, being slowly and gradually conformed the image of Christ. So God is faithful in who He is, God is faithful in what He says, and finally God is faithful in what He does. And, and it's really here that we find the most practical application for our lives. Burkhoff says that the faithfulness of God is of utmost practical significance to the people of God. This is the ground of our confidence. The faithfulness of God is the ground of our confidence, the foundation of our hope, and the cause of our rejoicing. It saves us from the, from the despair with which our own faithfulness might easily lead. It gives us courage to carry on in spite of our failures. It fills our heart with, with joyful anticipation. And even when we are deeply conscious of the fact that we have forfeited all of the blessings of God, the faithfulness of God is the ground of our hope, the ground of our confidence, the foundation of our hope, and the cause of our rejoicing. Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 24, says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. 
Deuteronomy 32, 4. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. God is faithful in what he does because he is faithful to his promises, to his vows, to, to the covenants that we just talked about a few minutes ago. The covenant that we as New Testament believers, as New Covenant believers, have, a, have a, the confidence in the, the covenant of Christ. The blood of Christ. We can trust that God, because he says it, he's going to do it. What he says he will do, all of the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Psalm 25, 10. So what are some of the ways that, that God is, is faithful as we think about it in the practical outworking of our lives? Well, God is faithful to punish sin. Because God is holy and just, all sin must be punished. All sin is either placed on Jesus, on the cross, or it remains on our own heads. God must punish sin. If you are here as a believer in Christ, all of your guilt, all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been placed on Christ. But if you are here this morning as an unbeliever, your sin remains on you. You are dead in your trespasses and sins and awaiting the coming wrath of God. So flee from the wrath that come. Flee to Christ and have your guilt given to Him. Have His righteousness given to you. And then you can trust that He will be faithful to you to keep His promises. In Psalm 73, that many of you probably read this week, as, as I hope that many of you read this week as part of a Robert Murray McShane's Bible reading plan. Psalm 73 talks of, it's a psalm of Asaph, where it talks about how he struggled with the wicked. How he, he almost fell, he says, because, because he, he had his eye on the wicked. He saw the wicked were prospering while he was struggling. Maybe we might be tempted to do that. And think about it in school, when, when, when students cheat. When, when girls are popular because they, they, dressed in, they dress immodestly or, or, or behave immorally. Or boys are popular because they, they drink and do drugs. Or, or in the workplace, when, when people get ahead by, by kissing up to the boss or, or by, by, by cheating at work. Or business, when, when people get ahead through unethical business practices. And we can be tempted to look at those people and see them prospering and be like Asaph. We could be like Asaph and, and, and really question the faithfulness, faithfulness of God. But, but down in, in Psalm 73, verses 16 to 19, Asaph found the answer. It says, but when I thought to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discern their end. You set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. So God is faithful to punish the sin of the unbeliever. But God is also faithful to discipline His children. Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5. Now, I want to draw a distinction here. The scripture makes a distinction between punishment and discipline. If you're in Christ, your punishment was put on Christ. But God disciplines those he loves. And, and, and embedded in that, that word discipline is the word disciple. When God disciplines those he loves, it means that, that he, he uses chastisements to, to, to show them their sin and to help them to grow. So in Hebrews 12, 5, it says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Now we can, we can know that, that God disciplines us and, and some of us have experienced that in various ways. I think we need to be careful not to, to, to say if somebody is in the middle of a trial, we don't go up to them saying God is disciplining you for this because we can't know. 
precisely about what God is doing. But we know that, that God is disciplining His children. But we also know that, that God, uh, well, in Psalm 89, verses 30 to 33, if my children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules and violate my statutes and do not keep their, their commandments, the, the word in here is used is, is punish, but it's, it's more in the context of discipline, that because I will punish their transgression with a rod and their iniquity with stripes, but hear this, I will not remove my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. God will not be false to his faithfulness. He will not cast off his children. God is faithful even when he doesn't seem like God is being faithful. Sometimes we can be tempted in the, in the trials of life to, to think that God is not there. Or think that, that God has somehow forsaken us. That's what Job thought. Job came to the point in, in his life where, where he began to question God. And God rebuked him for that. We can also think of, of Habakkuk. Habakkuk 3, 17-19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the, field, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He makes me fed, tread on the high places. This is a, a confidence that we can have despite our circumstances that God is faithful. We need to understand that God is work in our, at work in our present circumstances for His glory and for our good. We, we can also think of Lazarus in John 11. When, when Jesus found out that, that, God, that, that Lazarus was sick, he, he immediately ran to go to help Lazarus. No, He didn't. He waited. He waited two more days until Lazarus was dead. Until Lazarus was good and dead. <laughs> until Lazarus even stank. Because he had a greater plan that he wanted to do. In John 11, 4. But when Jesus had heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death, for it is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. God actually willed that Lazarus would get sick and die for the glory of God. Think about that. Incorporate that into your, your theological framework because this is clearly who God is and He is ultimately working for His glory and for the good of His people. Now because Jesus waited for, for two more days, does that mean He didn't care? Of course not. We, we, in the, the shortest verse in the Bible, in John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept, and our English translations really don't do it justice, but Jesus was angry. He was angry at death. He was angry at death. But he knew that he was using those circumstances for the greater glory of his name and for the ultimate good of his people. For Lazarus and for Mary and Martha. God is faithful to you, fellow Christian. God is faithful to you, not necessarily to give you what you want, but what you need. The last time I preached directly on the faithfulness of God was, was five years ago, a week before I was to get married. Now, you can see the gray hairs, and you can do the math, and, and, and you can realize that, hang on a second, he wasn't, he wasn't a spring chicken when he got married, and, and I didn't meet Jane until I was 42. And for a solid 15 years, I eagerly wanted to get married. I prayed earnestly for God to provide me with a wife. And for 15 years, He didn't answer that prayer until I met Jane. God was faithful to me through those 15 years. There were things that He wanted to teach me, things that He wanted to do in my heart, and those were the circumstances that He had ordained to help me to grow more like Christ. But God is faithful even if He never answers our prayer in the affirmative. We prayed earnestly for, for Liam's health. 
We prayed that, that, that he would be healed and would not need all that, that time in the, in the hospital. But God didn't answer those prayers. But we had a higher prayer in that. And those of, us who, those of you who walked through that with us know that you were praying ultimately that God would be glorified. Now that's a prayer that God answered. God glorified and sanctifying us through that trial. Think about that, that trial that, that you are facing right now. And, I, and there's, there's many of us in this church are going through, through trials, whether it's the health of our children or a relational strain or financial difficulties or, or all of the above. Whatever, whatever trial it is that, that you're facing, don't get bogged down in those external circumstances. Remember the faithfulness of God. And He is faithful to you. God is at work in those circumstances to shape you and to mold you and to make you more like Christ. Uh, uh, an answer prayer that is a far more eternal significance. Finally, God is faithful to save his people. Philippians 1 says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. This is a promise. That, that God not only began that work, but he is at work in your life, in your whole life, to, to use those circumstances to make you like his son, and he's going to bring you to bring those good works to completion in the day of Christ. It's not because of, of your faithfulness. Your salvation does not depend on your faith, but on God's faithfulness. If it depended on you for one second, you would fall away. Our faith is not in faith, but in God, the faithful one. 2 Timothy 2.23 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Our salvation is a gift from God from start to to finish. You didn't make yourself saved, and you can't keep yourself saved. When Peter told the Jewish Christians about the salvation of Cornelius, they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Acts 11, 18, God had given them the gift of repentance. God had given them the gift of faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, we are saved by grace, by faith, by faith and grace, not of ourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And the, the construction of that says that the grace and the faith and, that save are all gifts. It's all gifts from God. And God has given us His Holy Spirit as a seal, as a, as a down payment, so to speak. In 2 Corinthians 1, 20 and 21, Paul says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and has put his seal on us and has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And then finally, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. God has written the story of your life. And because God is faithful, the story of your life will have the happiest of all endings if you are trusting in Christ. You can rely on God. So there you have it. We, we've now finished our study on the attributes of God. I've just taken a couple of months to, to, to cover this, but I can easily spend the rest of my days preaching on the glory of God and never really exhaust its depths. But really, that's what I try to do each week. I, I try to preach on the glory, the glory of God every week and to highlight our proper response. And so really, I will, by God's grace, as long as he gives me breath, continue to preach his glory for the rest of my days. And I'm going to spend all of eternity marveling at his glorious attributes, knowing him as I have been known, and growing in my knowledge of him forever and ever. And all of us, 
Whoever's sharing Christ have that hope that, that we can proclaim the glory of Christ. That we can proclaim His attributes. That, that we can give glory to God. That we can hallow His name. And we can go to be with Him and worship Him forever. Let's pray together.